these folks have been involved for so long, doing so much, that one might think, one might think that they would get tired. One might even think that they would question, they would question whether it was worth it. And yet, they never do. I know these folks, they don't quit, they don't question, they just keep paying it away because it is always worth it. Look at where we're gathered here today. It is always worth it to be a struggler for peace and justice. And ladies and gentlemen, Michael McPherson is from United for Peace and Justice, uh, the, the consortium group of all sorts of anti-war groups across the United States doing incredible work. David Swanson, I don't even know how to introduce David Swanson because there's about 50 different things that he is doing, always. But the important thing to remember about David Swanson is that in addition to his terrific books, and he's written great books on history of anti-war activism in this country, as well as contemporary struggles to hold presidents to account when they lead the country into illegal and immoral wars. He has also worked uh, with so many different groups, and now working with Roots Action. But the important thing that people in this room should know, back in the depths of the Bush presidency, it was David Swanson, working with many people in this room, including Steve Cobble, who really took an idea called After Downing Street and made it a political reality, forced a discussion of George Bush's lies prior to the war in Iraq into the center of the American debate. And the fact of the matter is, we got a lot of people talking about it, and it would not have happened without the incredible work of David Swanson. And Medea Benjamin, is there anybody here who does not know the term code pink? And the fact of the matter is that Medea Benjamin has branded pink as the color of the anti-war movement. And, uh, but she's done a whole lot more than that. Medea, Medea has been an activist for many, many years with Global Exchange and other groups. Her work with Code Pink is so very, very important because we honored her at the end of the Bush presidency. The Nation magazine honored her as, and Code Pink as the most useful activist of the Bush presidency. And she said, unfortunately, I'm probably I'm hoping to be the most useful activist of the Obama presidency as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Medea Benjamin. <laughs> Let me start with Medea. Uh, you got a microphone here. Uh, Medea, <laughs> there was immense hope during the course of the 2008 campaign that a candidate who had spoken out against going to war in Iraq uh, in 2002, Barack Obama, and who really was elected in many senses with the support of folks who, at, at the end of the day, were erring on the side of their anti-war sentiment. They might have wanted, for, women who had for many years wanted a woman president, but they said, well, Obama's a little more anti-war, I'm going to go with him. How has Barack Obama uh, rewarded or responded to that the fact that the support that he got, which actually I think it's fair to say in many ways made him the president of the United States. The fact that the anti-war movement and elements of the anti-war movement were supportive of him at a critical point. Has he been an anti-war president? Has he been a war questioning president? Give us a sense. Well, first let me say that as a women-led group, Code Pink really focused a lot on Hillary Clinton and her pro-war stance. In fact, we had a campaign that went on for about over about a year uh, called Bird Dog Hillary Clinton. And we went everywhere she went and people would say, but she's a woman, don't you want a woman president? And we said, we want an anti-war president. And perhaps uh, many of us put our uh, feelings and desires into the vessel of Barack Obama and he wasn't quite um, the vessel that we, we uh, thought he would be or that he was. Um, there are many people, including David Swanson here, who will tell us exactly what it was that Obama promised, uh, and it wasn't to be uh, a peace president. But he did promise to get us out of Iraq. Now, interestingly enough, we should recognize that he had no choice but to get us out of Iraq, because there was an agreement that it was already signed under the Bush administration, because the Iraqi people forced that status of forces agreement uh, that said, we demand that the U.S. troops leave. And that was something that was inherited by Barack Obama. So it was good that he said he wanted to get us out of Iraq, but whoever came in was going to have to get us out of Iraq 
uh, because that what is, is what was agreed upon uh, with the Iraqi government. And we should recognize that the peace movement did play a major role, I think, in branding Hillary Clinton as a pro-war candidate and putting those hopes and, and dreams into Barack Obama. But he certainly uh, gave us a slap in the face afterwards, even for the promises of closing down Guantanamo. That was certainly one that he did make a promise about and never came through on. Uh, he did say Afghanistan was the good war. Some of us closed our ears to that, didn't want to hear it. Uh, some of us thought that he really couldn't believe that there was a good war, somebody as smart as Barack Obama. Uh, and uh, some of us uh, were very open to uh, hearing that and didn't vote for him or voted for him because they didn't uh, think the other candidate was going to help and um, didn't have much of a choice. Um, that said, I think still Barack Obama has been an even greater disappointment than some had thought. And that is because he has expanded the wars, uh, expanded the war in Afghanistan when there was a disagreement within his administration whether the surge should have happened or not, and he listened to those who said put more troops in. A disagreement that potentially went right up to his vice president. Right, right, exactly. And then the issue of the drone strikes. And the drone strikes is a huge issue, and uh, I have a book in the back for anybody interested called Drone Warfare Killing by Remote Control, because I think that is such uh, a, an incredibly dangerous policy that the Obama administration has not just inherited from the Bush administration, has inherited the beginnings of it from the Bush administration, but it was really has taken it on with full force. And these early drone strikes of the Bush administration were few. There were only 46 during the entire time of the Bush administration. I shouldn't say only six. There were 46, and that's a lot. Uh, but it has gone up exponentially under the Obama administration to now in the hundreds of drone strikes. And just in the last week, we have seen a pounding in Afghanistan and in Yemen and, and, and in Pakistan. So the Obama administration has taken this on with full fury and uh, has gone to new heights of violating other countries' sovereignty, of violating the rules of war, uh, violating the Geneva Convention, and I would say violating the U.S. Constitution, especially when it comes to killing Americans overseas without any kind of judicial process. So I think that we have been uh, totally uh, deceived by the Obama administration when it came to the idea that uh, he would not expand the wars into new countries. And the getting involved in Libya without any attempt to allow the Congress to have any discussion of that war uh, is another very dangerous precedent. So I think David Swanson will go even further than me in talking about how the Obama administration has become a war administration, but uh, I think that those of us in this room that thought that maybe an intelligent president like Ob uh, Barack Obama would say something to get elected, but really when he came into power, would recognize how much we need our funding here at home to rebuild this economy, uh, how much the American people are tired of war, and how these wars are not winnable to say nothing of the uh, the problem of killing innocent people and would have taken us out of the wars, uh, we have been sorely disappointed. If you, let me ask you one more thing before we go on here. I want to add, you, at the, on the floor of the Democratic National Convention in 2008, you were distributing uh, pink scarves. And an awful lot of those delegates were sort of proudly putting them on. My suspicion is that if you did so at this convention, it would be the same. That the, the base delegates of the Democratic Party are actually quite anti-war. Uh, many, in many cases, folks who are backbones of local anti-war activism in communities across this country. How do you connect a grassroots of a party to its president and to its, to its leadership? Well, there's a strange thing happening out there among the base of the Democratic Party. And that is there is, on the one hand, still enthusiasm for Barack Obama, not nearly on the level that there was 
the last election. I mean, the last election is a fervor, and you saw all of these young people who were dropping out of college and dropping their jobs and dedicating themselves full time. When we were at the NATO summit and doing a protest out there uh, every day of the week, there were a lot of young people from Chicago who were Barack Obama's base. And uh, we did a protest in front of his headquarters. And I was crying. It was so sad to see these young people get up and, and talk to the imaginary chair of Barack Obama sitting there in front of his headquarters. And they were saying one after the other, Obama, you broke my heart. Obama, you were the first president I ever worked for. You were the first, uh, 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 you were the first campaign I ever get, got involved in. Uh, I never gave money before, ever. It wouldn't have ever occurred to me get to give money to a, a presidential campaign. And I gave to yours. I gave everything I had to your campaign. And you just broke my heart. It was like they were talking to a, uh, a stilted lover, you know, that, that somebody who had really uh, abandoned them. And they were heartbroken. So it's so sad, I think, particularly for young people. I mean, some of us have seen this over and over and over again, and we say it's politics in the United States. But for those young people, they, they really had great hopes. So I think that there, um, there isn't that base anymore. Uh, they'll vote for Barack Obama, probably, but they won't drop their jobs. They won't get out there. They won't give their 110% for this. And then um, the other folks, uh, I think that they, there's still, when we were out on the streets yesterday, um, there was still a lot of enthusiasm out there for Barack Obama, but there was tremendous enthusiasm for the Code Pink message. And everybody wanted our, our, our stickers, uh, Make Out Not War, everyone wanted the stickers, I am a peace delegate, and we met a lot of delegates on the street. We said, will you wear these buttons? Will you wear the stickers? Uh, will you go in as a peace delegate? And they said yes, very enthusiastically. So you're right, John, the base of the Democratic Party is anti-war, but you know what? It's not just the base of the Democratic Party. It's the American people at this time. Uh, the polls show it is even the majority of Republicans that say that the war in Afghanistan is just not worth fighting. It's not just Greens, it's not just Independents, and it's not just Democrats. It's the entire base of this country. And so what is so strange is to have a total disconnect between the two-party system that is still pro-war, that is still giving the, our tax dollars uh, to the war machine, that is still saying we can't pull out of Afghanistan now because it would be such a disaster, where the majority of people in this country say we are sick and tired of war, why wait, pull the troops out now. So the two-party system doesn't represent what the American people are calling for now. Thank you, Benjamin. David Swanson, I was down on the floor of the Republican National Convention in Tampa. And I, I was, yeah, I am still the, the last defender of the Clint Eastwood speech. Uh, because in addition to the really cool thing he did with the chair, uh, um, I, he actually, I believe that Clint Eastwood called for bringing all the troops home right away from Afghanistan. He gave one of the most militant anti-war statements uh, of, of a convention. But the funny thing was, at the Republican National Convention, I heard Rand Paul say that in his speech and get a surprisingly loud round of applause. And, and several other speakers reference it. I'm intrigued, David. It, it, one of the things that, that I think there is a assumption of a Democratic president will necessarily be more anti-war. In reality, you've written a lot about this going back historically. Um, that's not necessarily a guarantee in and of itself. And, and I think the safer thing to say, and you've said this to me offstage, that the, really the critical thing is having an anti-war movement that, hold, that makes absolute demands on both parties rather than simply counting on a president of one party or, pre, or for Congress of one party to deliver. Talk about that for a little bit. I, I think the difference, of course, if someone at the Democratic National Convention were to propose a complete immediate withdrawal from Afghanistan, that too would win applause but it is going to be too slickly run for anyone to say that. They are not, I, I, I would not hold my breath for a Clint Eastwood type comment uh, at the Democratic National Convention that would give them that chance to have that applause. Uh, when Obama spoke in my town, uh, in Charlottesville, 
Virginia last week, uh, Tim Kaine introduced him and uh, spoke uh, in the most glorious terms about continuing the war in Afghanistan and encouraged people to go to the recruiters and sign up to go to that fight so that we could, uh, in his words, continue to put our positive thumbprint on that nation. You know, how much, you know, imagine the nations lining up. You actually use the term positive thumbprint? Yes, uh, so that you can imagine the nations of the world lining up to get our thumbprint next. Uh, and, and, and he, of course, received applause. Uh, anything, anyone says at any of these conventions receives unthinking applause uh, because people are there to unthinkingly support whatever is said by the members of their party at their convention. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, this idea that Medea mentioned that Obama was going to be a peace president even though he wasn't really quite running as a peace candidate, that for the first time in the history of electoral politics, a candidate wasn't going to just keep half his promises or all his promises. He was going to be better than what he was promising. It was this sort of, of wishful thinking uh, that, the, that those young people were suffering from who imagined that electoral politics was activism. You know, I mean, this is the scam of not automatically registering people to vote. You have this idea that running around registering people to vote is activism. Uh, and, and so you have this notion that by electing a candidate, you're doing something to change the country. Uh, which is a whole different notion from I'm going to make a rational lesser evil calculation and vote for the less evil of the two viable candidates and so forth on election day. When you carry that outside of election day to your life, day in, day out, through the year, uh, it, you, you become a tool for half of your government rather than government of the people taking your message to the government. And I think that's the fundamental flaw. That's what we're up against here. Um, you'll recall, John, that we were pushing for the impeachment of the last crowd. Uh, and people would say, well, you're just Democrats. You just don't like them. Bush talks funny. And we said, no, we have no ill will toward these people. But if they are not impeached and prosecuted and punished for their crimes, the next presidency will be worse. Regardless of party, regardless of sex, the next guy or woman will be worse. It was an easy prediction. It was right. It came true. So we, we have weapon sales to foreign dictators tripled last year. We have the military promised bigger, delivered. It's bigger. It's more privatized. It's more secret. We have the CIA with war powers. We have a new kind of war. We have drone wars. We have wars not with the lies to Congress. They don't bother with the lies to Congress anymore. Wars against the decisions of Congress in Libya, supporting one side in Syria, threatening Iran in the Democratic Party platform, which the, the, I, I checked the platform that the Nation magazine proposed and the actual one, and I found some overlap. They both had 10-point font. The, <laughs> the, the Democratic Party platform says... Iran must stop violating the non-proliferation treaty, which, by the way, it isn't, or we will attack Iran, military attack on Iran. This is the platform of that party. And, and so if, if you go into this, if you go into this, and, and by the way, John Conyers, right, who, who finally got permission from Nancy Pelosi to hold an impeachment hearing if he promised not to impeach anybody no matter what he heard at the hearing, uh, and we said, you are passing these evils on to the next crowd. He said, I will finally support impeachment if he attacks Iran. He meant if a Republican attacks Iran. And that's so natural to us. It, just, it, it's, it, it would seem crazy to suggest that that should be carried over to a Democrat. It's outside of our thinking. We say, we're the third rail. And in the next breath, we say, we might win the election, as if that's us. So it's this identification with the party that's the problem here. It's when we take our message as independent activists through all the tactics of marching and protesting and lobbying, but from a position of independent principle stand, that we can begin to influence this party and the other parties and all the parties. If the, on the next panel, you can ask David Siegel about the movement for internet freedom getting its position in the platforms of all the parties. Mm -hmm. This is what the anti-war movement did in the 20s when that was a lot easier. And that's where I want to take you for a second. And, and this is really, to me, this is one of the 
the, and we're not going to go deep into too much history here, but David's been writing a lot recently on those moments in American history when anti-war politics became universal politics. It became the, the given, like nobody wants to get rid of Social Security, except maybe Paul Ryan. Uh, but, to, you know, that, that anti-war position was when everybody had to tap. And I think folks in this room may, may feel like, wow, it's, uh, this is wonderful to hear David Swanson say, you know, bold, strong things from Medea Benjamin, but this is naive. This is silliness to, to imagine that you could have a country that would uh, have such a strong anti-war sentiment that it would become a universal in our politics. But it's happened in America, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it would, when... When they want to legalize torture, you know, they pull out Federalist papers and they pull out all sorts of comments. They want to legalize bribery in our electoral system. They pull out marginalia on Supreme Court proceedings. We have laws on our side that we don't hold up. We have the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which banned war in 1928, which is still on the State Department's website. It's still the law of the land, and we don't bother to mention it. And we don't bother to remember how our great-grandparents created it. And, and a lot of things were different in the 20s. The military-industrial complex barely existed. The farmers had more pull. Being anti-war was not being anti-American. It was being anti-European. We wanted them to buy more grain and fewer weapons. Uh, the, the newspapers were far more open to our views. Uh, the universities, I mean, the, the peace movement was run by the university presidents, not the university students who were getting pepper sprayed. Uh, it was a different world. But the activist movement was different too, and it did not identify itself with a party or a candidate. It put the outlawing, that is the, the criminalization of war, in the platforms of the Progressive Party, the Socialist Party, the Democratic Party, and the acceptance speech of President Coolidge, uh, who would be re-elected on the platform of outlawing war, which was then eventually done. And, and this was done through a movement that was steady and long-term and built itself around principled moral activism without this coming and going based on the outcome of elections and, and, and partisan uh, favoring. Uh, and it made a difference. Uh, it made a difference to have that principled, moral push to ban murder on a larger scale, uh, which was how war was thought of. They said, look, we're, we're making progress. We got rid of blood feuds. We got rid of dueling. We didn't just get rid of aggressive dueling and keep defensive dueling. We said, this is barbaric. We're done with it. This is what we're going to do with war. Uh, and they took a huge step and passed the baton on to us, and we've forgotten what they did, so we don't know how to take the next one. Uh, but this idea that we do it by picking a party or picking a candidate, if this doesn't end come mid-November, if in mid-November we begin obsessing over which schmuck we're going to vote off the island in 2016, we're done for. If we don't build a movement to force our entire culture in the direction of peace and sustainability, we're done for. David Swanson. Michael. So, I mean, United for Peace and Justice seeks to build a movement. And uh, formed, formed in, in those terrible and complex and somewhat inspiring days when we were trying to stop George Bush from going to war with Iraq, and extended now through all of this time, United for Peace and Justice has brought together hundreds of groups across the country uh, as a coalition movement to try and, and not just stop wars, but end wars that we are in. I, the, I'm interested in a lot of things from, from where you're coming from, but I'm especially interested in, did it get harder to build an anti-war movement when you had a Democratic president? Was it easier with a Republican president? Yeah, it, it was easier under, under President Bush. I also want to say I'm, I'm a member of Veterans for Peace. So and and you, should tell us, you should tell us about it. I think it's very, very important because Vets for Peace, uh, it, to my opinion, has sort of led the, it's almost always out there first on, on so many issues. Drones now, but on impeachment of President Bush, on so many different issues. Uh, tell us about your, your service background and then and give us a, just a quick hit on Vets for Peace and then let's go into these things. Okay, just real short, I served in the, what's called the first Gulf War and I also have a son who served in Iraq so I'm a military family speak out as well. And I, I, was an officer. I started out as an enlisted person and I became an officer, a captain in the army. 
Um, what was that? But, uh, and Vets for Peace, give us a sense of what Vets for Peace is. Because well, I'm Veterans sure most people here know, but we've got yeah. viewers that might Right, know. right. Well, basically, Veterans for Peace is a number of veterans who decided that war doesn't work, uh, that we need to move in a different direction, all the things that we're talking about right now. And so people decided to get together in 1985 and, and start an organization using our voice as veterans, our experience as veterans, uh, to say that there's a better way to do this. Uh, so that's basically what our organization is about. And, and now to take you to that core political question, that the ugly political question. Yeah. It got harder. Well, you know, er earlier when you talked about uh, uh, basically a lot of the people who were in the anti-war movement at the time were really people who were angry at the Republicans more so than, they, they believed in peace to some degree. But it was easy, I think, to attack the Bush administration. It was the place where they were most vulnerable was around Afghanistan, less so Afghanistan, but definitely Iraq. So the anti-war movement, the peace movement, acted as an umbrella for people to come together. And it's actually a, a, a person who did a survey who's in the audience right now, uh, who in the survey it showed that uh, most of the people who came out during that period of time uh, identified as Democrats more so than they might have identified as being in the peace movement. So for me, it was an expression of peace, but also an expression of um, being pro-choice or an expression of fighting for civil rights, or an expression of all the different issues that more times than not are identified with the Democratic Party against the Republican Party. Which leads to, I think, one of the reasons it's so hard uh, for the peace and anti-war sentiment to really gain traction. Because it's one thing to, to, be, to say yes and clap for being anti-war and being pro-peace. But then you have these other issues that pull you in a particular direction. So, because people identify with the Democratic Party when it comes to these issues I just spoke of, civil rights or being pro-choice or uh, whatever the different issues might be, uh, yeah, I'm pro-peace, but I got to make sure that we move legislation on the civil rights. So I got to make sure that we stop the, uh, the uh, so-called pro-life people, or I have to stop whatever these different issues are. So, Peace and anti-war kind of gets put on the back burner, although they might be for it, it gets put on the back burner. But then there's other things I believe that also are undercurrents in, in uh, our culture and our society. There's American exceptionalism. People are actually believe in that the United States has the right to do certain things in the world. And that, that belief is not a right belief or a left belief, per se, you know, or a Democrat or Republican belief. It's an undercurrent that runs through most, I believe, of our culture. So although people might be um, anti-war and pro-peace, they're also schizophrenic about, well, how do we do that and at the same time maintain a certain level of dominance or exceptionalism or whatever. So there's, people are not really sure how to do that. Because when you talk to the average person, first of all, they're not sure about, well, how do you have a peaceful world? They might look at you and say, well, that's, that's impossible. I'm for it. I love it. But how do you do that? And then they'll start talking about the different countries in the world, saying, well, those people are dangerous, or you know, those people are crazy, or those people are this or that. And so there, there's these, these undercurrents that we, as the peace and anti-war movement, have to deal with. And the last thing, and I'm glad you guys brought this up, that I also believe plays a role in this, is that it's not a political movement we need. We need a social movement. Because if you have a social movement that, that people change their values, and it changes the culture, then exactly what you're talking about, both sides of the political spectrum will say, well, we need to be, because don't forget, just like uh, Reverend Jackson talked about, there was a flip pretty much between Republicans and Democrats uh, in terms of- That wonderful economy. phrase that Jefferson Davis right. Democrats became Ronald Reagan Republicans, Lincoln Republicans became uh, Johnson Kennedy Democrats. Right, right. And the point of that, though, is that our parties are organizations to move forward agendas. That's basically what a party is. And a group of people with similar agendas get together to move that forward. So a party that has a certain principles today can flip those principles tomorrow. That's just the way that it is, and we can't forget that. So what we need to do is make sure that we infuse the agenda into more of the society, which is not a political action. The politics comes from that infusion of the agenda into the rest of society. So we have to do things that aren't, they, they end up being political because of what comes from them, but they're really social things. We get out and we talk to people, we 
can challenge people's ideas. We listen and don't act like we have all the answers because we don't. And we, we change people's minds, and they change our minds too because of a back and forth discussion. And we actually make our presentation better by listening to people's fears and where they're coming from and their understanding of things. And then we can say things to them and they'll say things to us and we'll say, oh, okay, yeah, that works. And next thing you know, a lot of people are thinking the same thing and then both parties start to want to make that change. Um, a real, an example of that was um, when, what's the, the presidential candidate, the third party presidential candidate when uh, Ross Perot, thank you. Ah. And yes, and he, it, was the, it was the deficit. The deficit, the right. deficit. And that was a big deal and across the spectrum, people were looking at the deficit as being a problem. He won, what, 6% of the vote or so. Next thing you know, Republicans and Democrats were talking about the deficit. And that diminished the number of people that were following him to where I guess the next time for some other reasons too, because he was crazy and things like that. <laughs> but, but the next time he ran, I think he got like 1%. Actually, no, the truth is he started with 19 and went down to 6. Yeah, after he dropped out. And, yeah, well, no, it, oh. it was just a crazy ride. Right, Let's just right. acknowledge but, but, that. But, but you he succeeded point. in putting an issue in. Right, right. Yeah. That on both sides of the, of the, the divide we talked about, it became a value. And, and so both parties were able to pull his voters because both parties absorbed it. That's right. Let me keep on. I want to. But you want to say something? I want to get her in a second. I want to keep you on one thing here. First off, you're talking about how do you get people to think about peace as something possible and real. We have some lovely people up in the corner there uh, from U.S. Department of Peace Movement and uh, an, an effort to, uh, and the National Youth Movement for U.S. Department of Peace. It's important to understand that that what seems like a radical idea is, in fact, as David Swanson will tell us, the kind of idea that people used to think about a lot and talk about about these notions. So having an agency that actually seeks to promote peace might not be a bad idea. Um, but let me also talk, I'll keep you on for one second on American exceptionalism. Uh, at the Republican National Convention, uh, I, this was such a dominant concept that, that America is in fact superior and that it, what it does in the world is good by the nature of the fact that it's done by America. Uh, I think Democrats maybe dial that down one degree but you'll hear much the same thing here. And is it possible to redefine American exceptionalism? Could it be possible to say, yes, America is in fact a great country, a fabulous country, uh, but its superiority might be in its promotion of peace rather than its uh, promotion, or rather its engagement in war? Right, so just the first thing about how much the Democrats now are back. I think that they conceptualize it in a different way. It's less xenophobic, for example. You know, it's less fearful of the other, at least here. So, so in those ways, it's about that. But the idea of destiny, of mission, um, those things are, are just as prevalent in the Democratic Party. Um, every president talks about uh, the mission that we have in the world. And on the left, um, it's the idea of human rights, of um, humanism, um, is one of the things that push, pushes this idea. Um, on, on the, on the, on the, on the, that's on the left. On the right, it's more of a God-given thing. It's more religious. So they just take different forms. I'm not sure how much they actually dial down the one party or the other. Um, as far as whether or not uh, we can change it, well, the reality is that every country has a myth about itself. So you're not going to get rid of the myth or we wouldn't be a country. I mean, we can't fool ourselves and think that somehow, you know, we can just get rid of the myth. So we have to change the myth in some way, the, the interpretation of the myth, um, because we can't get rid of the idea of the myth. So I do agree that one of the things we can do, because we are, I believe, an exceptional country in some way, obviously, we're, we're large, we have a lot of people, we're diverse, um, people come here for various reasons. So if we were to take our resources and our ideas and be fairer in the world, um, talk about sustainability, um, pull back militarily and all those things um, to bring to help bring peace, because we can't bring peace, you know, but we can help bring peace. That would be a new kind of conception. So we do need to redefine it. But don't don't believe we can get rid of it unless unless you want to break the US up, you know, if you want to do that. But then other that, countries That's actually the them. next panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's say let's let Medea take a shot here, then we'll bring David in. Well one thing that hasn't come up is that war is a big business. 
and the power of the lobby groups that benefit from war. I mean, remember before the U.S. even invaded Iraq, we had Dick Cheney's company, Halliburton, get a $5 billion no-bid contract. I mean, that, and, that should tell it all. that no-bid contract, if we just clarify, was to build all the forward bases for the war, the, that, at that time, ill-defined war on terror, which is a pretty good deal. Like, it's, as long as there's a war on terror, you get to build bases. I mean, and one of the components of that is that all that money that goes in, they hire lobbyists and bundle campaign contributions. So in effect, isn't the United States government funding the pro-war lobby? So it's just a vicious cycle, money in, money out, money in, money out, and it's our tax dollars in, and then that goes to build these companies that then buy our elections and corrupt our elections. And it is, uh, I moved to Washington in the naivete that under Obama if we you, could really get something. If you could right. add one more anti-war individual to Washington, D.C., that would tip the balance. <laughs> hey, I was from San Francisco, lived there 25 years. I said, what's another anti-war activist in San Francisco? We need more of them in Washington, D.C., right? I mean, that was smart thinking. But um, so going to Washington, D.C., and then going to these hearings and sitting in these hearings, and it's just disgusting because you see, even in the hearings, the industry, they don't even bother standing online. Like we get up at six in the morning to get online to get into these hearings. They pay people to stand online for them. And then they come in all nicely suited and smelling nice from their showers to take their place in line and just sit there and look at the Congress people to say, you know, we're here, we're here. Um, they don't have to do that, though, because it's all behind the scenes anyway, and it's the revolving door of people who were Congress people and now are heading companies. I mean, the Dick Cheney thing is just symbolic of everything. And now another example is the drone industry, and it certainly is big business. Well, what did they do when they wanted to make sure that Congress would do their bidding? They bought Congress people, just like any good weapons industry or other lobbyists would do, and they got 58 people who were elected by we the people to say, oh, one of the most important things I was elected for is to form a drone caucus to make sure that this drone industry can sell more of its goods overseas and here at home. And they are so powerful that they passed a piece of legislation saying that the Federal Aviation Administration has to open up our airspace to these drones that are so unsafe that the Air Force even admits that a third of their own drones crash. So that's an example of the power of the weapons industries. And you know they are also so smart that they make a piece of their weapons in every congressional district so that they can say, and their congresspeople then say, well, this is a jobs program. You certainly couldn't stop the production of X, Y, or Z weapon because that is a jobs. And it's true that weapons are one of the only things that we continue to manufacture in this country. So when we talk about building a social movement, it's even bigger than that. We have to build a peace economy. We have to get ourselves off of being dependent on weapons that kill people around the world because we have to depend on them for our jobs. And whether it's engineers that I've been meeting as I travel around this country with the drone book who say, you know, I'm beside myself that this is the only job that I can get to pay for my children's college or pay for my uh, mortgage because there's nowhere for an engineer like myself to get employed except by either the Pentagon or one of the companies that sells their weapons to the Pentagon. Um, or it's a young person out of college who can't find any job except going into some piece of the military industrial complex. We need a peace economy. One of, uh, we, we, it, it's absolutely true that we fund the lobbyists for the killers. Uh, we fund the lawyers for the health insurance companies that fight giving us health care. We fund the lobbyists for the weapons companies that dump all of our money into weapons. We fund our executioners. We also fund both sides of the war in Afghanistan. 
uh, through payment for safe passage down roads in Afghanistan, we are the number one source of income for the other side of the war. So you're funding both sides of an endless war without a vision of victory in sight for either side. This is, this is some sort of definition of madness, except for those profiting. And you try to bring this up at Obama events, like the one I got thrown out of on Wednesday uh, up in Charlottesville, um, completely different town from this one, but also named uh, as this one is for the wife of a king against whom we fought a revolution because he had powers in no way approaching the powers we now give to presidents. Uh, we couldn't mention these things. We couldn't mention the kill list. We couldn't mention the fact that there was a front page story in the New York Times and media coverage everywhere about the fact that our president keeps a list of nominees for murder. Men, women, children, Americans, non-Americans, and checks them off on Tuesdays who gets murdered next. We couldn't chant protest against that because it would be like talking about UFOs with these people. They don't, they've never heard of it. Right? There is selective education, uh, selective media sampling uh, in our country, uh, and, and, and so people choose not to know. So we could say get out of Afghanistan, and we were told to get out of the event, but, but we couldn't protest most of the things we needed to protest. Let's keep you and, going. Oh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I want to keep going. You got a good riff there. Uh, okay. No, but, but well, I, do wanna, I want you to extend the media component, because this is an interesting thing. It is, it, we, I, I think there's got to be people, you know, at, in corporate headquarters and in political headquarters who are thrilled that we talk about it how bad political players are, how bad political parties are, how bad corporations are, but sometimes leave the media out of the equation. We have a media in this country that is very much a part of the campaign industrial complex, do we know? I, I think that those who say the one fundamental problem that we all must work on is the lack of a decent democratic small d communication system are absolutely right, just as are those who say, no, no, it's, the, it's climate change and the natural environment, just are those who say, no, no, it's our civil liberties, just are those who say it's the money in the campaigns, it's only the money, that's the one issue. They're all right. Uh, and I wouldn't stop anybody from working on the one that most engages them. But you know what? There is an all-encompassing evil that we can come together on. And it's called the military, industrial, congressional, media, technological, academic complex. And the fact that we dump 57% of discretionary spending into it every year and don't talk about it is a problem. The fact that the ACLU and civil liberties groups will fight the torture and the assassinations, but never the money that produces these evils. The fact that the Sierra Club and the environmental groups will fight the destruction of our natural environment, but never the number one destroyer of it that fights the wars to destroy it and has pockmarked our nation with toxic cleanup sites is the problem. The fact that the groups that want money for education and money to fight poverty won't look at where 57% of our money is going is the problem. If we could unite every issue, every demand to fight the, the growing evils and to produce something good around what Eisenhower warned us of 51 years ago, we could undo it. It would be far, far easier than we imagine. It is perfectly within our grasp, but we have to be willing to take it on. We have to address the military industrial complex. And what keeps it around is something that Michael touched on, that you have this Republican, this right wing, this, this vicious xenophobic idea that we have to wipe out the Iranians. We have, we'd be better off with an earth without Iranians. And you have this leftist, democratic, progressive, Tom Perry Yellow, uh, Center for American Progress, uh, a Vaz idea that we have to bomb the Iranians for their own good. That we have to, that, so, you know, racism can be genocidal racism. Racism can be humanitarian racism, but these are things that it's been taboo to do to white people for 65 years. Uh, we have to continue our progress on the question of racism, which primarily manifests itself right now in our wars. And so this idea that this election is about the danger of putting a racist in charge of our program of bombing brown and black people, is, it, it just is so twisted. And it misses the fundamental issue here of where we're putting 57% of discretionary spending. David okay, Swanson. Yeah. Uh, let us take Spring Michael in here for a second.
Michael, we pivot in election, especially the point in the election where you have conventions, and that's why we gathered to, to have discussions during the convention, perhaps discussions that were a little bit different than what you will hear on the floor of the convention. Uh, but, but this is a point at which we look to have a, look to a, a new term, be it sitting president or a, a, another president. Give us a sense from, uh, UFPJ is out trying to build these movements, trying to do this work. Uh, what do you foresee in a second Obama term? Imagine that President Obama is reelected. What do you foresee, are there, is it more possible to challenge? Are there areas that you would work in? And then also give us a quick hit on what you would foresee as a particular challenges with the Romney term. Well, that's a really good question. What is a second Obama term? Does it change? What, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that President Obama would feel empowered to do some things that he felt that he couldn't do, or at least I hope he felt. I don't know what he felt. Um, also, uh, I think one thing that's changed for him is that this idea of trying to bring together people, uh, trying to compromise with, regardless of how we might feel about his policies, I'm talking about him trying to get something done, and how he feels. I feel that he believes now I can't really necessarily work with these people. Um, and maybe he might go back to trying to, depending on how they react to him being in office. So I would think that he'd be more combative and trying to do some things for it. The question is, what are those things, which I really don't know. Um, as far as the peace and anti-war community, and I think the progressives in general, one of the big mistakes, and, and Reverend Jackson spoke to it earlier, is people kind of sat down and went, so, People were saying, well, we got to give them a chance. And, and the reality is you have to make politicians, I don't care who they are, you got to make them do what you want them to do or they're not going to do it. If I was going to be in office, you had to make me do it, even though I said I was going to do it. So we can't, no matter what. But I think under Romney, it's the same thing. Because what's going to happen, I mean, by that I mean we can't sit down, obviously. Because what's going to happen under Romney, if he was to get in, the, the right wing activists aren't going to sit down. They're going to be so damn happy, and they're going to be charging forward. Yeah, but they will also make demands. They're very yes, good. But they'll be yeah. charging forward on yeah. making, that's what I'm saying, charging forward on making what they want to see happen, happen. So obviously, to me, if it's Romney or Obama, we still have the same challenge. We have to get out there and make the demands and make it happen. It doesn't, it doesn't matter which one of them gets in. One of them would be harder than the other, obviously, because if Romney gets in, you know, we're going to be on the defensive. Hopefully, if Barack Obama wins, would be at least more on the offensive. It's a matter of how much more. But I'm going to ask you. Let me ask you a quick technical political question here, because you're on the defensive, policy-wise, but on the organizing side, you again go back to that situation where Democrats who are upset with an administration now kind of they, they step up more right. as regards protests. So right. defensive as regards policy, perhaps on the offensive as regards protests, and, and an easier scenario in there? Well, I don't know, because it depends, once again, it depends on what the House and the Senate looks like. Yeah. I mean, you know, what we're, that's why I go back to things before elections is where things really happen. You know, an election is a snapshot, and then after the election happens, all the inertia from before it is going to play itself out. So we have work to do that's really going to play itself out in the future. You know, so so we, I, I, I don't want to get so stuck on the election that we don't realize that the work is not just about the election, it's really about what happens after it in between. You know, and, and so I think the difference is going to be what we do when we talk to individual people who don't agree with us and struggle with them over ideas and help people change over time, not what's going to happen in November. I mean, we got to deal with that, but it's really about what happens afterwards, in, in my opinion. And when you, when you go up there, I have some posters to say, like, fun jobs, not war. Martin Luther King is on those posters. Those are the kind of things I think will help people when they see those things, especially with King. They'll start to think about it. So please take some of those posters, especially if you're going to be at the convention, so some of the delegates can see, see that. Thank you very much. Michael, oh, first, let, one let last you, thing yeah. I want to say about American exceptionalism that's in both parties is mission, is virtue, which means no matter what we do, um, it's good, and there's destiny. We have a destiny. And Barack Obama talks about that. George Bush talks about that. Romney talks about that. All of them talk about those three things. To me, those are the three major elements of how people see American exceptionalism. Michael McPherson. Let me give this.